Ali. Maybe she's not done talking to you. No. If you've talked to her, give her a few minutes and I'll let her talk to you. Do you know that I'm that I'm doing this for myself and for you? Well, you, you better remember something. You're not doing it for me and me. You're doing it for yourself and God. All right? You're the one who has to answer to God. So do you. I will answer to God. Don't worry about it then. I have my, my positives and my negatives in life, and I will answer to God. Don't worry about it. Baba, all as that I as... do is a reflection of you. You're in good shape, man. <laughs> You're in good shape, all right? So are we at peace? I never knew we were at war. He wasn't exactly thrilled when I walked no, jab either. No, you weren't. I mean, I neither was my mom and dad. They, they, I took it off after two weeks. I mean, it's, it's natural, but you got to know what you want to do. If you want to do it, you're strong enough to do it. That's the end of it. There's going to be days where you probably are going to want to take it off. You know, some days are stressful. But I think you're strong. <laughs> Mohammed tells you that, you know, you should always give what's best uh, for your daughter. And me as a father, I'm just trying to give my daughter the opportunity to be able to see life from a wider angle and a bigger perspective. All right. People would immigrate into different parts of the country, but what was interesting is that they would all manage to find their way into Dearborn, a great many of them. And the reason for that is because the mosques were in place. Dearborn's newest mosque will be the largest in North America. Like the first mosque in Medina, it is being built with help from the entire community. There's great feelings of ownership to the mosque when the community builds it. People are baking food. Every year they contribute between fifty to one hundred thousand dollars to the income and the operating cost of our mosques. So we have the building of this mosque, kind of metaphorically, and the laying of the bricks, and this new foundation with all these new immigrants in Dearborn. And everybody brings their contribution. Prophet Muhammad established the first center in Medina for Muslims, and that was his mosque. And it was not only a place where Muslims go and do their prayer or offer their supplication. It was the center for the entire community. It was the headquarter of the Prophet. He would become a judge and solve problems among people inside the mosque. So he receives delegations. He would declare war or peace. The mosque was serving multiple purposes in the life of Prophet Muhammad. It was at the mosque that Muhammad discussed a sweeping change in policy with his followers. After years of exercising restraint in the face of persecution by the Meccans, Muhammad received a clear new revelation that marked a dramatic departure from the past. It gave the Muslims limited permission to take up arms in self-defense. The statesman was about to become a general. For 13 years, there's been no sanction to fight. Then a revelation comes that says those who have been removed unjustly from their homes and have been fought because of their religious beliefs are sanctioned to fight to defend themselves. Killing is always abhorrent. The Quran makes it very clear about that. And it, the Quran is, says that it's always uh, wrong to start a war, to be an aggressor. But persecution is worse than killing. When people have been driven from their homes or deprived of their basic human rights, or when an evil ideology comes into the world, sometimes, regrettably, it may be necessary to fight and, and sometimes lives will be lost. Muhammad's first large military engagement occurred near the town of Badr, when 313 Muslims set out to surprise a caravan from Muhammad's own tribe, the Quraysh. In a sense, the Battle of Bada, which became such a landmark in uh, Muslim history, uh, was a sort of mistake. Uh, the Muslims had planned a conventional raid, but the Meccans, when they heard that this band of renegades was attacking their great caravan, were so enraged they sent out the whole army against them. And the Muslims were convinced that they were going to die. 
he never wanted to fight the Meccans. I mean, the Meccans are his people, uh, his, his friends, his family. He wants to co-opt them. He wants to make them the key, if you will, to the new Islamic ummah that he's trying to form. So he doesn't want to go to war with them. As he prepared to lead the Muslims into battle, Muhammad took the unprecedented step of establishing clear rules of engagement for his army. He makes it very clear to his soldiers that if they have the right to use force against the Qurayshis, that does not mean that they will do the same thing that has been done in pre-Islamic wars, in which women and children could be killed, in which no prisoners could be taken, no quarter given. No, no. He said Islam is a religion of law. The Meccans had sent an army of about a thousand men. As the army approached, Muhammad prepared to make a stand near a well. One of his soldiers suddenly questioned his strategy. Has God revealed it to you, he asked, or is it your own opinion? When Muhammad answered that he was speaking as a man, not a prophet, the soldier suggested that they stop at a larger well closer to the enemy so they could deprive them of water. Muhammad agreed at once. The change in strategy proved decisive and the Muslims recorded a resounding triumph. It was a victory that stunned the Muslims. It seemed like a, a complete reversal, like a, a miracle, almost a sort of revelation of God in history. A furqan, they called it, something that separated uh, the just from the unjust. After the battle, Muhammad received a revelation, claiming the victory for God. The Muslims felt that angels had been fighting alongside them. The victory reaffirmed their belief that God was on their side and raised Muhammad's status higher still. But his followers also knew that the Meccans would seek violent retribution. A year later, an army of 3,000 Meccans returned to face 1,000 Muslims in the Battle of Uhud. The resulting rout left the future of Islam in mortal peril. It was a horrible battle and the corpses of the Muslims were mutilated by the Meccans and the Meccan women, as was their wont, uh, came out onto the battlefield and, and danced around the corpses. Many of Muhammad's soldiers lost their lives in the battle, including a rabbi who had honored the Medina Pact by fighting alongside Muhammad. The families of the fallen Muslims were now without protectors. Then, Muhammad received a new revelation, allowing Muslim men to safeguard these women and children by taking as many as four wives, but only if they could treat them equally. That in itself, in the context of Arabia, was a bit of a restriction because a man could have unlimited number of wives. The context of the permission to polygamy is to say who is going to look after these women. And it was an act of faith, not an act of lust, that inspired men to take more wives. So it, it would be wrong to think of the prophet as basking decadently in the garden of sensual delights with his harem. His harem was very much a matter of state um, and uh, sometimes his wives were rather a mixed blessing. Although Muhammad was monogamous during Khadija's life, after her death he eventually married a number of women, including one of the Uhud widows, Umm Salama. The reason for his marriages were really political alliances. It was a tribal society, and for Muhammad to marry into another tribe and to take a wife just meant that there was a bond being created with this tribe. Among Muhammad's wives were the daughters of his two closest allies, Abu Bakr and Omar. Abu Bakr's daughter, Aisha, would become one of the most influential women in his life. Aisha was very lively. She was uh, brilliant. She was somebody that questioned the Prophet. She was not somebody in any way that um, took everything. She questioned him. She said, what does that mean? Uh, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Um, she was somebody that really had an incredibly active mind. She memorized vast amounts of prophetic traditions and she's considered to be actually the transmitter of a large number of uh, traditions from the Prophet Muhammad.